Good evening. I'm Rebecca Klassen, Associate Curator of Material Culture at the New York Historical Society. Before we been, begin tonight's discussion, I would like to thank our trustees, our Chairman's Council, and all of our members and other generous donors. Uh, your support allows New York Historical to continue to pursue our mission to make history matter. We are thrilled to have recently reopened our doors. Um, to reserve your timed entry tickets, please visit our website at nyhistory.org. Before we launch into our program, I want to let you know that it will last approximately 45 minutes, including 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end, which you can submit via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen at any point during the presentation. We have disabled the chat function, so um, please make sure to use the Q&A. Um, and after the presentation, we'll get to as many questions as time allows. Slide, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, tonight I'll be looking at two cigar ribbon tablecloths in our textiles collection, uh, which I, I personally think are, are quite gorgeous, um, as a launching point to open up broader discussions on the rich context of their making and their intended purpose. I'll be exploring the cigar making industry in New York City, which dominated uh, global production during the late 19th century. And then I'll be talking also about these tablecloths as incredibly manly items <laughs> uh, with which to kit out your bachelor's den at the turn of the century. So the cigar ribbon tablecloths um, formed a core of a, a display in our textiles case um, in our loose gallery, which opened, reopened in 2017. And, and that gave me the opportunity to explore them in more depth. Um, the book is certainly not written on them and, and there's much more for me to investigate. Um, however, I, I think they're very fascinating and worth sharing and, and I hope you do too. So this is the first example uh, made sometime between 1890 and 1900. And it is truly um, eye dazzling with its rich, vibrant yellows in, in a subtle range of shades. And the printing that appears on the stripes of cigar ribbons, um, which are laid across the surface in, in triangles placed at angles, and then um, a diamond configuration in the center. So it, it's really remarkable, um, it, its condition um, is really remarkable considering the, the fragility of the silk ribbons. Um, it has a floss, um, silk floss fringe and velvet borders. Um, and this type of needlework is, is often referred to as a quilt, but it's not properly considered a quilt because it lacks batting at the center and quilting stitches that would pierce through all the layers of the object. So not a quilt, technically. Next slide, please. Uh, here is a detail which allows you to see the printing more clearly. So the, the sheer profusion of typographic styles accompanied by the logos is really notable and it does beg you to look closely. Um, and so here you can also see the, the decorative herringbone and feather stitching that tacks each ribbon to a foundation layer um, as they abut each other. Um, and that foundation layer might have been a muslin or, or similar low value fabric. Um, and then the entire thing is then backed with silk fabric. Next slide, please. So the clear precedent for this type of work, uh, both technically and conceptually, is the more widely known uh, crazy quilt genre. Um, so though this, the shape of this example of crazy quilt tablecloth by Maria Ewing Sherman Fitch, who was the daughter of General William T. Sherman, uh, it's highly unusual in its shape, um, but, but it's a meaningful comparison for its highly personal approach and its collage aesthetic created from collected scraps, as well as the decorative stitch work that, um, like cigar ribbon needlework, tacked the pieces to a foundation fabric. So um, visually, it's very dynamic, much like cigar ribbon needlework. And both crazy quilts and cigar ribbon needleworks were intended as nice showpieces to display in your home, uh, rather than what you might think of as, as an item to keep cozy and warm. The origins of crazy quilt making are, are still unclear, but um, the format reached the height of, of popularity in the 1880s and 1890s when a luxurious silk and velvet style was fashionable. So, so it slightly preceded, but also overlapped with cigar ribbon quilts. Next slide, please. Um, and here is the second cigar ribbon tablecloth in our collection. It's dated slightly later than the first example based on my rough estimation um, in trying to identify some of the cigar brands. Um, and so instead of fringed, this example uh, has 
it is completed by a wide velvet border and, and has tassels at its corners. Next slide, please. And here's a detail of, of that second one um, from the center of the piece. And you can see again um, the feather stitching as well as the appearance of red in the ribbons. Um, and while the examples of cigar ribbon needlework that I'm showing you are, are both tablecloths, cigar ribbons were also fashioned into sofa pillows, table mats, tobacco pouches, um, lambricans, and, and even clothing um, in a couple of documented instances. Next slide, please. Um, so now as a caveat, uh, I'm not a, a cigar expert. I, I, I tried one once and, and that was that, um, but I, I know that there might be some serious connoisseurs who might be tuning in, that's always a possibility, um, as well as some labor historians. Um, so in the Q&A function, uh, if you have any insights that you would like to share, please do so. Uh, but so what are cigar ribbons? Uh, these ribbons would be tied around um, cigars and, and bundles of 25 or 50 for distribution uh, from about the late 1860s into the 19 teens. Um, and these were produced in yellow uh, to reflect the Spanish heritage of cigar making via uh, colonial Cuba, but, but sometimes they're green or red or blue. And um, they are printed with a brand of cigar and sometimes the, the category of the cigar and the manufacturer. They ranged in width from about uh, one half of an inch to, to an inch and a half, and their length really depended on how many cigars uh, they were intended to bundle, um, logically. Um, so the examples shown on the left are about 19 inches long. Um, and you can apparently still buy bundles of, of cigars wrapped in ribbon today from Cuban manufacturers. As you can see, an example of, of how that would come packaged in the image um, on the right, which is dates to 20, 2005. Um, so brand differentiation was really a key strategy for cigar makers who, intense, uh, who faced really intense competition during the late 19th century and registered names proliferated wildly. Uh, cigar aficionados played really close attention to the brand um, as an assurance of quality and pricey cigars, of course, connoted a, a prestige experience. Um, so the best cigars were, you know, of course, thought to come from Cuba. And so even manufacturers um, outside of that country took advantage of, of markers like Spanish names and the gold and red of the Spanish flag to provide an extra marketing push. So the first tablecloth that we looked at incorporated at least 196 uh, ribbons representing the sale of between 4,900 and uh, 9,800 cigars, which um, I'll note sounds like a, a really extraordinary number for any individual smoker. Next slide, please. This photo of a cigar factory um, in New York, uh, taken in 1915, shows workers uh, rolling and bundling cigars. So you can see the bundles of cigars resting um, along the top of the rows of work tables there. Um, and during the 19th century, New York was the capital of cigar making in the United States and one of the major centers in global production. Um, its output outpaced that of Havana and the industry was the second largest employer in New York after the garment trade. Um, it was focused in Midtown and Lower Manhattan and producers ranged from one person concerns um, and tenement workshops to high volume factories, um, employing mostly immigrant women who were valued for their dexterity and cheap labor, of course. Um, New York also became a center for trade suppliers uh, from cigar box makers to lithographers to create the printed labels to, of course, cigar ribbon weavers. So the major supplier for ribbons in the country was William Wick Ribbon Company and its founder, uh, William Rick, uh, emigrated to Germany, I'm sorry, from Germany uh, to help in his brother's um, cigar box business. And in 1882, he established a large factory on the East River um, at 31st Street, and he supplied everything from ribbons and boxes to, to molds and tools. By 1889, the company reportedly employed um, nearly a thousand workers and wove 24,000 yards of ribbon a day. Next slide. Uh, but in the 1860s, before the close of the Civil War, um, U.S. cigar production wasn't significant, all things considered, and, and cigar smoking wasn't as popular as it would be in later decades. So at this point, people are living 
people living in the U.S. preferred snuff um, and chewing and, and pipe tobacco. Uh, there was domestic production, but it was focused mostly on farms for local production, uh, local consumption, that is. Um, but there were 200 million cigars produced a year um, and fewer than 5,000 cigar makers, so that is people making cigars. Um, it was focused on artisanal production in small shops, so say um, fewer than five people. Um, and that changed in 1863 and also at the, at the close of the Civil War when the US government imposed a tariff on um, foreign produced cigars, uh, which is where the most desirable cigars came from, such as those made in, in Cuba, Germany, Spain, and England. Um, the tariff was intended as a way to raise revenues uh, to finance, finance the war. Um, that higher cost, though, had the effect of increasing domestic production and also bringing those foreign cigar makers to the U.S. Um, in, in a sort of push-pull dynamic. At this point, cigar making predominantly was a very skilled labor and one that was done by hand. So this was craft, and they were making a wide array of shapes out of three different types of cigar leaf um, through their dexterity. Next slide, please. In the 1870s, um, domestic production increased and so did con consumption. In 1868, the cigar mold uh, was introduced from Germany and so that meant that semi-skilled laborers, uh, meaning cheaper workers, um, could more easily make cigars. So you didn't have to spend years uh, perfecting your craft using your fingers, you could use a mold. That meant that increasing numbers of women uh, were hired in factories, often performing tasks like stripping tobacco, uh, as you can see depicted in this illustration from 1877, but increasingly they were hired to make cigars using molds. And as indicated in the caption for this illustration, women were also hired to replace striking union workers along with immigrants such as Bohemians and Chinese men. Um, in Manhattan, that meant that manufacturing increased tremendously. There were 1,500 shops in 1873, and all of this production was, again, as I mentioned, focused in Midtown and Lower Manhattan. After the panic of 1873, there was a shift to tenement production, um, as well as the manufacture of super cheap cigars, um, such as five cent cigars or stogies. Next slide, please. Um, so in this well-known photo by, by Jacob Rees, the, the social reformer and journalist who brought attention to the living conditions of impoverished New Yorkers. We see a, a Bohemian family, um, modern day uh, Czech Republic, um, making cigars out of their tenement. So the boy is stripping tobacco into lengths and the man is rolling cigars. And you can see his cigar mold on his work table um, propped up there against the wall. Next slide, please. Um, so in 1890, the U.S. produced 4 billion cigars a year, and then um, by 1909, cigars are the most popular product in the country, though that would be uh, eclipsed not too long afterward by the cigarette. Um, so cheaper cigars farmed with molds using semi-skilled labor in large factories was the norm. So large factories being like a thousand people in that, in that ballpark. Um, there were about 350,000 brands of cigars so think about those ribbons and how they're printed with the brand. Um, while not, not every brand would merit a ribbon, um, that's still a large number of possibilities. So to reiterate a previous point, uh, the competition was really intense and brand differentiation became very important in terms of knowing where each brand was positioned in terms of quality and price. Next slide, please. Um, once cigar ribbons left the cigar store, uh, they were generally seen as a, a throwaway item, but they made their way into various everyday uses, um, such as uh, something to wish to fasten your hair when you braid it, um, or to bundle up the letters you've received, um, or, or even as a bookmark. Um, w. H. Kramer, in his Book of Magic Tricks, admonished the reader to, to not be so thoughtless as to throw them away, because um, there's you know, easily a half hour's fun um, and doing a magic trick with an, with an uncut ribbon. So you can make it seem like your fingers pass through the loop. Woo, amazing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in the 1880s, there were occasional suggestions for, for using cigar ribbons in needlework projects, um, such as these 
ribbon embroidery patterns from 1886. Um, this particular one is intended to depict sunflowers. So the vibrant yellow of the ribbon was thought um, to be very suitable. Next slide, please. Uh, needlework items where cigar ribbons are really the star don't arrive until around 1891. Uh, the earliest mention that I could find was an article um, in the New York Times that mentions a sofa pillow and, and other cigar ribbon needleworked items at the New York Exchange for Women's Work. Uh, the Exchange for Women's Work was founded by Candace Wheeler and Mary Atwater Choate in 1878. And it was really a place where women who were say gentlewomen, uh, but were in need of funds, uh, could make things or offer services for sale to uh, earn an income. So the article says, a pillow on such an original plan has never before been made in this city and it is judged by scores of ladies who viewed the beautiful piece of fancy work that is the most a unique idea ever presented by a lady of the exchange. Accompanying the pillow are two tobacco pouches, also made of cigar ribbons. The name of the originator is withheld. The pillow is designed for the apartments of a bachelor, and it is needless to say it will, that it will bring a big price. Um, and apparently the woman who had also made a tablecloth that she had sold to somebody in England already. Um, the point that I would like to underscore here is that the pillow was designed for the apartment of a bachelor specifically because of its uh, cigar ribbon components. So these items were meant as gifts for men and to decorate male quarters, um, such as bachelor's dens, smoking rooms, um, and studies. They were seen as super masculine. Um, and it seems that this uh, novel form of needlework spread across the country through newspaper accounts um, with cities reporting on, re on reporting from other cities. So for instance, in 1892, um, the Kansas City Star reported that the Chicago Globe wrote about an article on display in New York at the Women's Exchange featuring a cigar ribbon tablecloth. So now where would women procure all of these cigar ribbons? Well, they could get them from friends, of course, uh, but they could also get them at cigar stores. So the Chicago Tribune reported on a woman um, buying ribbons at a cigar store, um, and she wanted assurance that Reina Victoria Extras, um, the, the brand that was printed on them, were good cigars. Um, and, and she bought 50 of them for four cents each. Uh, the proprietor, um, according to the reporter, um, said that the cigar ribbons were, quote, the latest fad for society women. You see, it's quite a thing to have a cigar mat made of ribbons originally tied around 7,500 perfectos. Though that's a type of cigar. Um, the young man who gets a mat of that sort looks upon such an ornament as the most valuable thing in his smoking room. Next slide, please. Um, in 1894, an article in Harper's Bazaar says, well, what better thing to, than to have been invited on a friend's yacht? So don't you want to, to get him something as a token of appreciation for that exciting event? Um, the writer recommends that, you, well, you could do a, a cushion or a small table cover. Um, and there are, quote, few things more expressive of the masculine in decoration than the pretty squares made of a sort of mosaic of cigar ribbons joined with herringbone stitch. A man will often be found obliging to collect the necessary ribbons for a friend, especially if he is to be the recipient of the finished work. Um, the names, meaning um, here being the brands, add piquancy to the composition. Um, now, what, what made them so masculine and, and so eminently suited for decorating? Um, well, let's take a, a very quick visual tour of bachelor spaces. Next slide, please. Uh, so by mid-century, bachelor spaces were seen as highly personalized interior spaces for reflection and, and for comfort, and really to um, escape women and social obligations. Across the second half of the century, uh, men dedicated entire published poems and short stories um, centered on their bachelor sense um, as a hook to, to reflect on the passage of time, pleasant memories, um, especially of college years where you were around other young men, um, and, and other, also people not in the room, so love interest and, and lost loves. Next slide, please. Um, a bachelor's den could mean both a single room or um, especially by the 1880s, an entire apartment or a structure or a public space in which men communed exclusively with other men. 
So um, mostly they refer to spaces of unmarried men, uh, but they had analogs for married men um, in rooms intended for, for smoking or billiards or in libraries. So this is actually from um, a series of stereo views by G.W. Edmondson, who was um, a, a religious activist and a, a temperance, a temperance activist. Um, and so here, the, the bachelor's den is obviously a, a den of iniquity and no good can come from being in that space. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the bachelor's den was above all a space where individual interests uh, could be represented um, through the physical surroundings. So with carefully chosen items, perhaps haphazardly arranged, um, because one trope of the bachelor is that he might be very messy, um, the room would reflect the spiritual and intellectual life of the inhabitant. So Mary Gay Humphreys, reporting in 1889, remarked that this um, smoking den belonging to the, to the Philadelphia-based architect um, Frank Furness is, quote, is regarded as one of the most notable rooms in the country. It seems that a man could not express himself in a more ideally virile manner than in this room. Um, and of course, Frank Furness was an avid hunter um, and explored the, the West quite a bit and brought back his hunting trophies to display around his room. Next slide, please. Um, smoking was seen as one of the key signs that you were in a bachelor's den and it was, um, associated in literary works with hallucinatory reverie and contemplation. Um, women had, had their parallel spaces, as one poem from 1891 notes. Um, it's titled Two Hypocrites, um, and it was published in newspapers in Boston and San Francisco. Uh, the first half of this, this short poem uh, begins by describing a woman um, sitting on a rocking chair in her cozy chamber, um, according to the poem, uh, with her bonbon box uh, next to her, writing a, a letter to her lover. And she says, oh, I long for you now, my darling. There is never a bit of comfort for me unless you are near, end quote. And the, the second half describes her lover reading the letter from his perch in the bachelor's den with his feet on the mantle and a box of cigars and a pipe next to him, and quote. Um, and the smoke clouds wreathed above him as he echoed her lonely cry. Oh, I long for you now, my darling. Um, and so I, the irony there, the hypocrisy is that um, they're both yearning for each other, but uh, perfectly happy in their separate spaces. Uh, next slide, please. And um, bachelor spaces were where you could hang emblems of your sporting life, such as the boxing gloves hanging from the mantle in this um, set of photos. Uh, bachelor spaces were also where men, uh, were also where men um, would hang photographs they were given by women. Um, or other such uh, portraiture, um, and sometimes hung as a sort of gallery of women friends, um, so as to indicate a, a very lively uh, love life. Um, and they were also understood as places where bachelors might hang um, an assortment of risque imagery procured at a cigar store. Um, next slide, please. So tying it all together, as it were, um, is an illustration that appeared in The Bachelor Book, which is a magazine for bachelors, um, the Esquire of its day, um, interesting enough, hounds by women. Um, and in 1900, uh, an, an article appeared in the magazine describing a den, the, the ideal den. The story is a conversation between two men, and one man had just found an apartment with another man, and the friend says, well, I've just gone to see the, the den of our friend, and..." Um, you know, so-and-so, and, -so. and it's the most aristocratic taste and it's really great. Um, it has a, a sense of, of casual abandon about the place and, uh, but you know, it's not too original or innovative or, or weird. Um, so this den, uh, it includes sofa pillows really nicely arranged on their sofa and they've managed to collect um, 20 pretty sofa pillows, most of them in dark oriental colors. Um, here I'm quoting, um, one is bright yellow some girl made it of cigar ribbons, and one is green and with a big head of Mephistopheles embroidered on it. So the idea here is that they were gifts from women, men could collect them, but also women could collect cigar ribbons by going to a, a, a tobacco shop um, or, or that sort of thing and buying them in mass. Um, during the 1890s, uh, comfort in domestic interiors was emphasized by filling a sofa with a large number of cushiony pillows um, in a variety of designs. Um, indicating your, your artist, artistic taste. 
Um, so fluffy pillows were, were really great to sink into after a day of making social calls, and they were huggable and, and snuggable. Um, and as one writer noted, sofa pillows were like a clam um, in that it never talks, and so you could confide in your pillow. Uh, you, you couldn't have enough pillows. Um, and as one writer in 1894 said, uh, no one was known, ever known to scorn the gift of sofa pillows, no matter how many, or sorry, uh, no matter how often or and how many were bestowed. Gentlemen particularly are always pleased to receive them, and the recipient never fails to show with great pride to his bachelor friends the new pillow just sent by his best girl. A craze for souvenir pillows has superseded that of the souvenir spoon, and now bachelors are reaping the harvest. How fantastic. <laughs> Um, and so these emblems of affection uh, were also part of the courtship and, and sociability rituals um, and, and quite a bit of flirtation. And it, so it wasn't just an, uh, an indicator of the desirability of men um, either. Uh, a woman who gathered enough cigar ribbons, it was presumed, um, knew a lot of men and was familiar with their tastes. Next slide, please. Um, by the first decade of the 1900s, um, so, so fairly quickly in the grand scheme of things, women were showing cigar ribbons at agricultural fairs and, and similar events, um, and the genre wasn't so closely hewn um, to the idea of making them for masculine spaces. In this advertisement, a, a craft publishing company um, based in Boston beckons to needle workers um, as a supplier for bulk ribbons really divorced from the, the, their, the context of the original purpose and potentially never having touched a cigar. And um, so while this is still very much a, a topic of ongoing research for me, uh, my, my current thought is that notions of femininity changed at the turn of the century to encompass greater independence and physical freedom through ideas such as the new woman um, and, and the embrace of, of activities like sporting um, and cigarette smoking um, taken up by women uh, from the 1890s onward. And so uh, perhaps women making needlework from cigar ribbons um, and, and later on cigarette premiums could uncouple from the idea of making them for men um, in their lives and instead savor the pleasure of making them for themselves and really the pleasure of making. Um, so at, at this moment, it's unclear to me um, exactly when people stopped making cigar ribbon needlework, um, but it seems that it must have happened sometime in the um, early 1910s when the demand for cigars and then cigar ribbons um, declined with the rise in popularity of cigarettes, uh, cigarette smoking during World War I. Um, and now I'll be looking at any questions you may have added to the Q&A function, um, and, and hopefully I'll have the answers. <laughs> Let's see, uh, this is a good question. Is there any reliable information? Oh. Uh, okay. Is there any reliable information about the ethnic composition of cigar making workforce? Um, so cigar factories tended to be very um, uh, specific in terms of the, the ethnic um, emphasis, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word. So um, a, uh, one might be exclusively Chinese workers, one might be exclusively um, German, uh, et cetera. Uh, and there's intense competition between those groups. They you know, saw each other as undercutting each other, um, and especially when it came to uh, union negotiations and, and that sort of thing. Oh, somebody says no question, but this is a very Excellent presentation, incredibly interesting. Thank you. Um, let's see. Has New York Historical Society ever had these cigar ribbon quilts on view? Um, so yes, the, they were on view in, uh, in 2017. Um, they were the inaugural display in our reopened uh, Loose Center Gallery um, in the textiles case. So in terms of demonstrations of masculinity, what would you say is an equivalent of the cigar ribbon quilt today? That's a really good question. I think um, today people are really exploring the edges of what masculinity means and they're exploring, um, in terms of thinking about gender, 
uh, people are thinking about gender fluidity, I would say that that's more the conversation today. And also embracing um, fiber art uh, as, as being appropriate to men, specifically knitting. So somebody asks, ribbons now often have a more feminine perception, hair ribbons, bows, wrapping presents. Did the term slash concept of a ribbon not have the same connotation at the time? Um, it, it doesn't really appear to be the case. And that's why uh, in part, I find this um, exploring this genre so interesting, especially when we think about it um, very specifically uh, in its origins in the early 1890s and what people thought of it then. Um, you know, the idea that people would call them pretty specifically for bachelors is very interesting. And I think there's a lot of work to be done um, in, in unwrapping that, as it were. Um, do you know how many tablecloths from cigar ribbons survive? I don't, um, I, I don't think they're as um, prevalent as say crazy quilts. Um, they, the cigar ribbon silk is much more delicate. Um, it can be quite fine. Uh, and so um, the condition can be an issue. Uh, I think, you know, some museum collections have them, but I think mostly they are held within private collections. Let's see. I have seen felt national flags associated with cigars, any connection, some have holes for sewing. Yes, um, so I think with the cigar ribbon fad, tobacco manufacturers became very savvy um, about the demand that um, uh, needle workers would have in collecting um, uh, tobacco premiums and or other ephemera um, in order to sew with them. And so, for instance, with um, cigarettes, especially, um, and cigar silks, um, they're manufactured for that purpose uh, and, and meant to be collected. So let's see, could the ribbons or the tablecloths be washed or cleaned in any way? Um, one can always wash them, <laughs> but I would not recommend it. <laughs> Um, they're quite fragile and silk does not do well in, in water. Um, at this point, I would definitely consult a conservator if you have such, if you're fortunate enough to have these types of items in your home. Um, what recommendations do you have for taking care of these beautiful objects? Um, laying flat is always ideal. Um, rolling, if that's not a possibility, um, you know, rolling them around a, uh, a tube of some sort, a soft tube. So here's another question. Is this an American craft or is it also Cuban or Spanish too? If so, are there examples of this? Um, I haven't seen examples from uh, Cuba or Spain. Um, I'd say, why not? Um, I think the New York Times article from 1891 was really tantalizing in its um, note that the woman who had um, a, a pillow or tablecloth displayed had also sold one to Engl somebody in England. So it strikes me that um, you know this this craft could have um, spread to Europe as well. So, but I'm really not sure. Um, let's see. Do you have a favorite quilt you have researched and why? I really love these. Um, I think they're fascinating and. Um, I think there's so much more that I could explore with this topic. Um, I, I definitely am curious to think, um, I'd love to think more about the impact of the Spanish American War on the perception of cigar ribbons um, and how that would have been seen in the domestic environment. Um, also, I'd love to get a little bit more granular on, on the cigar brands that are represented in the quilts themselves. Um, is there anything in your home that you would liken to a cigar ribbon quilt today? Wow, these are some really <laughs> stumper questions. Um, I don't, I, I would have to say no. Any other questions?
All right, so if there are any other questions, please feel free to add them. Um, and also, if you have any insights into um, you know, the history of cigars, uh, your favorite um, brands, et cetera, please, please do weigh in. Um, and you know, I'm also happy to, um, oh, here's a question. Does NYHS plan to put them on view anytime soon? Um, well, I do hope that, that this particular group of objects can uh, do, do a, a redux. Um, yes, I, I'm not sure about the timing, um, but certainly they will be out again. All right, well, I guess I'll just wrap this up now. Um, so we look forward to, to seeing you back here uh, a week from tonight for the next episode of Curator Confidential, which is Late Breaking News, Revolutionary War Maps with Nina Nazionale, who is Director of Library and Operations um, and Curator of Printed Collections at New York Historical. Good evening. <laughs>